Okay. Okay. Are we all good? Okay. Hey everyone, my name is Justin Gaffrey with Gaffrey Art Material, and today is our first of hopefully many live uh, videos demonstrating and helping people understand about our paints and texture paints. So, my goal today is to introduce all of our paints, and so I'm just going to start. So, I started Gaffrey Art Material because of this texture paint. This is what I've been painting with for years. And I have developed this paint in a full color line and we keep developing colors. However, this paint actually is used with lots of different paints. And so if you look at this painting here that I did a couple days ago, it has all of our paints in there. And I'm just gonna show you. So all this gray, this is our base coat paint, which is base coat is when I was starting to paint, I painted with house paint because I was a folk artist and I just painted with ever any kind of material I found. So I painted with a lot of house paint. So this is like a glorified house paint, but a lot better. So this is a highly pigmented, heavy acrylic concentration paint. paint here that I use like a house paint, but it's a little thicker than house paint. And it's got a lot of pigments and it's just much higher quality than a house paint. But I use this for a lot of my backgrounds. And so that's what this gray is that's on this painting. I'm actually gonna paint a painting like this and kind of demonstrate how all these paints work together. This other paint here is one of my new favorites, this is number five. And so number five is a liquid white and I'm gonna expand this line eventually in different colors, but what I love about this paint is it's, it's got the perfect amount of viscosity just to hold it together, but it's very liquidy. And this has a ton of titanium white and it stays wet a lot longer and it glides like silk. And so that's what this horizon where it transfers into from the horizon into the, the base coat, the number five and in, into the texture and it blends perfectly. So it goes from the base coat into the texture down here. And I love this paint. And then we have our acrylic colors here. And so these are like our traditional heavy body acrylics, but we call them medium viscosities. And like, for instance, this yellow is what's brushed or knifed over the titanium white texture. And all of the deep, rich colors here are like Nori, Viridian, and Carbon Black. So basically what I wanted to do today is I want to demonstrate how all these paints work together. However, I want to hear from everybody what kind of questions they have, if they had any questions. And, you know, I can stop any time into the painting and kind of I'll learn from what inter what's interesting to you guys. And yeah, so I'm going to get started. So I'm going to move this out. And so this is just a raw wood panel. These are our wood panels, our birch panel with the pine sides that have these awesome bracing in the back here. And so what's great about the base coat is we put clay in this base coat. And so even though it has a lot of pigment, and a lot of acrylic, it kind of works as a great medium in between gesso and your base coat. And so you can use this as a foundation coat, but you can also just leave it as a finished coat. And that's what I love about this. And it goes on, we put just a decent amount of viscosity and you can see it almost gets full coverage in one stroke. And so I'm gonna basically cover my whole panel with this base coat right here. And I made it just a little thicker so because I'm a painter that likes hand feel to it, and you can see the brush stroke in there. I like to see that it was made by a human. Now, the number five will go on a lot flatter. It's got a different viscosity, and it actually, it might go on, and you might see brush stroke, but it actually flattens out, and this will actually hold its brush stroke. So I would do two coats on this, but it's mostly covered in one coat. And I like to move th through paintings fairly quick sometimes, and I, so I really like that. And a lot of times I have some fans up here that I can get this to dry in just a couple minutes before I go on to my next coat. Fans are definitely my friend in you know, working in different layers of acrylics because I can get some dry times just in a few minutes, enough where I can go into the next coats because I kind of mostly paint wet on wet, and, but sometimes I need 
the base layer to be dry. Does the base coat perform better on canvas or wood panel? It's the same. It's going to perform exactly the same on either one. I'm just an artist that prefers to work on wood for multiple reasons. I work with a lot of texture and it, I need a support structure that can hold the texture. However, I also, when I'm doing a lot of detail painting and I don't want it to show the tooth in the uh, uh, brush stroke there, I can get it super flat. And so you can draw or paint into the detail without all those little cross hatches on canvas. But that's just my preference, is the smoothness of the wood panel. How many coats will you put on? So right now that's one coat and I can see through the wood in a few places. So I'm definitely gonna do two coats. But what I'm gonna do here right now is I'm gonna introduce my horizon line, which is around here, which is where I'm gonna introduce the number five. And while that's drying, I'm gonna work on my horizon. And a lot of times by the time I get the first coat in the horizon, I'm going back with the final coat on the uh, base coat there. And this is just one style of painting I do often my paintings are completely textured all over. I would just do a loose coat, a base coat, and there would be texture all over. However, this particular type of painting I'm doing, I like the negative space with just a little bit of texture on it, like up, right up here. You can see right here, I like all this negative space of that and just pops of texture, as opposed to, you know, I don't know if you can go all the way around there, like that painting I did for the Ida auction or this one down here, it's textured all the way through. So this again, like I said, this is our number five, and this is the silky smooth white. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna use this to cut in my transition. It's gonna mix a little bit in the gray, so it's not gonna be pure white, but that's okay, because then I'm gonna transition it up a little bit so it has a nice gradation. So I'm painting on this easel to have for demonstration where it's super vertical. However, often when I'm painting, I do lay it down some, but the, and particularly when we're filming it, you get more glare on it. So I do like to work at angles and you kind of start to test the angles of how the acrylic will hold on there. So I love using particular things. I'm going to show later how I use a bag as a tool, but what I love about number five is I'm just going to run my horizon line there and I have my paint in. And now that's just my style of painting. I'm kind of just really loose and like to move through things. So uh, it doesn't bother me that it drips a little bit because it's all going to become cohesive together. If I would have done that when it was straight up, it would have just dripped straight down. And so right now I'm going to kind of work how these two start to gradiate into each other. It's not going to be the final part of the white on the horizon, but I want the white to kind of glow. I want, you know, like all the, the lightest color is going to be here and slightly into the water on the horizon. So right now it's looking a little darker, but the final coat will um, be a lot whiter. And see these both just kind of blend in perfectly together because they're all acrylics, you know, most most all acrylics start to blend in together really well. Do you paint over several days or do you usually go in one go? And how do you, how, I do how would you accomplish ways. that? It's, it's, for me, it all depends on what type of painting I'm doing. You know, when I work on landscape paintings, I like to work through them mostly from start to finish. And, and that's just a style of painting I do because it makes the paintings feel like they have life and movement to them. However, when I'm working on a lot of detail painting, sometimes they take weeks for me to work on. And especially when I'm doing detail of any kind of figurative work or some conceptual work that has a lot of thought into it, landscape comes to me as kind of indelible in my mind. And so a lot of landscapes I paint are based on a lot of places that I live or have been. And I create them at, there's just kind of like a, 
all that imagery is in my mind, so then I kind of make up the places based on that imagery. So it doesn't take a lot, it's kind of very natural. It works along with the muscle memory since I painted so many of these in my life that I can just move through them effortlessly. But I don't paint all my paintings that way. Some of them are very laborious. And so right now, I have an option. I can keep this very kind of uh, loose crosshatch in here, but I found myself drawing this linear line into the horizon, so I'm kind of confusing myself a little bit here. I gotta decide which way I wanna go, or if, if I can kind of, kind of incorporate them, because where this gradation is, if I wanted to just jump into a loose crosshatch, crosshatch pattern. And so, um, basically, um, I do need a little more dry time on this so I can get pure white into this area right here so it's not graded too much into the gray. So I'm just going to let that work to sit there a second. Uh, while that's drying, I can talk about some paints too. I'll just give that a couple minutes. Let's see here. So on these colors, these next colors, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw down with the base coat and lead into texture down here. And I'm going to, so I'm going to gradate the base coat down, figure out where my water is, and then start building up and down, back and forth. And so my next one, I guess I'm still going to be working with number five. Let's just go ahead and do the water. So sometimes when I work on a horizon, I, do, I use tape to make a hard line, but I want this one to be kind of a little bit, you know, hazy in the background, so you cannot quite tell if you're in the horizon, like if you're in, you know, the land or the, or the sky. And so I'm gonna kind of just blend them two together so you can't quite tell the difference. So I'm gonna let that dry and we're gonna bring in some of the dark areas here that's gonna be, we have a lot of like uh, sawgrass and these uh, pine forests that kind of lead into the water. And so I'm gonna bring the grasses and it's gonna darken up in here to pop this white out right here. So I'm gonna put just like a foundation of that color in there really quick. Let's see here. I think I'm gonna use our nori green as our foundation in there. So I'm just kind of roughing in, doing the, um, what do they call that? Um, the values. I'm bringing the dark values in here right now for the land areas. And so I'm also creating my, my horizon where the land is here. And what's great about landscape is, um, you know, compared to like a figurative work, it's all organic and so you get to make up a lot of things. But one thing will be important is to make sure I have the horizon line the same on each side. So often I'll just take a stick or a brush to know. So when I come over here to this side, my horizon is the same length or same height. How do you keep the paint fluid over days or weeks since the key aspect of the thick paint is being able to push and move it? Do you wet it and cover it? So I keep, I of course keep the paint covered when I'm not using it. As long as the paint, co the, the, the paint itself stays covered, like often in the bags. So when we, when, when I cut the bag open, by the way, we have clips coming for these soon. So you're going to be able to just clip them shut. So it's just like if you were working with a traditional paint tube, from traditional acrylic companies, you're gonna squirt a little bit out. And so since we don't have a screw cap on there, I paint a lot, So, but I just squeeze it. And technically that is sealed there, it's really thin. But right now we put paper clips in there. 
Often in my studio, I just fold it over and just, and it's good. But we have these new clips coming that will just clip it shut. And so as long as it stays shut in there, it's good for years. It'll stay wet inside there. Once you put it on your palette and you want to keep it um, um, wet, I keep these little deli wraps here and I just place it over the top of them and, and keep it wet right there. And I often do that, um, you know, overnight when I'm working on a palette and I'm gonna come back to the same palette in the morning. So how would you, so let's say you have your background and you wanna paint uh, wet on wet a couple of days later what kind of medium would you use to keep it wet on wet again? So it all depends on where I'm at in the painting. So like if, if let's just say for instance, I walked away today, I'm gonna to come back tomorrow or the next day or a week or a month or a year from now. What I'm gonna do on this particular piece is exactly what I'm gonna do right now. I'm just gonna, you know, the main areas, a lot of the composition is all based in this area right here. So I'm just gonna add my white back in and just start working it again and put a wet layer over because that's exactly what I'm gonna be doing right now because it's kind of dry already. And so I'm just gonna go back over the white. You can see I don't have that gradation anymore. And then I'm gonna to have to go back and work in both gradations. However, since I know that I'm gonna leave this kind of as a mass of gray, only part I have to focus on is this transition. I'm not gonna to have to focus on any of that up there again I just got to get this to transition back in. So let me get that white horizon in there and then I'm going to focus on getting a little bit of gray in there and how I'm going to transition this back into there. So like, for instance, like the question was if I'm, if how we go back in, I'm only going to focus from here to here from now and get in all this area wet again. This painting's very fitting for uh, a rainy day in Florida. When I was working on this painting though the other day, when I was thinking about it being gray, I didn't want it to feel dark. I wanted it to feel vibrant like after a rain and have that where everything is kind of glistening and glowing and feels good after a rain, not like dark, stormy rain. That's kind of was my goal when I was working on this series, especially, I'll show you that 48 by 24 I did yesterday. And often what I'll do sometimes, and so I have this transition between the light, this is the number five, in there and this is might be a good place where I want to on the horizon bring in some texture as like a cloud formation which I think I might do that and so this is where I use these bags as a tool so I'm gonna cut this tip off you know about a half inch off of there you can see right here so that's that and so I want to have a nice cloud swoop in I don't want to do it right in the middle so I'm gonna pull it off over here so right at that transition and this might be hard with my easel standing straight up. I'm going to push the boundaries of gravity. I'm going to take a little bit of, you know, Payne's gray would be actually a good color to be using right now if I had some. I'm going to mix a little bit of phthalo blue and black. And this number five again works great for mixing colors too. And it keep this number five will keep these colors. So I want to bring just a little bit of grayness into the cloud. I could have used the same base coat, but it's got a little bit of blue in there. So it's going to give it this, this cloud a little bit of color into it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of swoop this up. You can see on there, the clouds are always swooping up. And so this is the thing is I'm holding the palette knife like this. And just, this is basically where I'm holding the palette knife and I'm just using the bottom of the knife right here. And I'm going to, and I, I practice, I practice these like almost like people practice like a golf swing and I practice my movement to make sure 
I'm gonna get that memory as I go because I wanna finish this in one stroke because I like the way, and I'm gonna show you why, but you're gonna get this really beautiful gradient and if you go back and touch it, you're gonna lose it. And so here we go. So I didn't quite get it in one stroke, but that's okay. I'm gonna put some more paint on there. My knife was bent a little bit, so I'm gonna bend it. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit more white paint in there, kind of do that over again. So there's like two clouds here. I'm gonna swoop this one. So I got a little bit of paint on there, and now I'm, I'm going, because I wanna leave that. So why don't you uh, jump in real close? So I want to leave this right here where it has that um, nice gradient in there. I don't want to touch that again, but I have some paint left. And so I'm just going to drag it just like this cloud, you know, it's kind of coming across there. But you can see here, this is what I was trying to say, like in one shot, this gradient here is what I want to keep. I'm going to do the same one here with this dollop. It was kind of a hard angle doing it from across. So I'm going to drag this in and kind of homogenize that together. So I might as well, because I'm not crazy about the way that happened, so I'm going to do another swoop up there. So that's what's fun about clouds is, you know, there's no right or wrong except for the fact of when it starts to mess up my composition. And I really didn't want to pull too far into the center, and now that's, that would be my only thing. I pulled a little too far in the center. I wanted to keep it over here, but that's just the way it is. So I might go ahead and just give myself another cloud in here. Oh, there goes that gravity. I'm gonna drop it down for this one a little bit. So again, I, I'm only painting vertical because it's easy to show, but I like to paint usually at, at an angle because it allows me to not worry about the paint follow off, but it just feels natural too. I think I'm pretty happy with those cloud formations. So you can see right here, I kind of cut into all the way into the board where it wasn't completely dry. So but this is a good opportunity for me to just get a little bit more white in this horizon area. And this is the area that I really want to focus where it's going to be brightest where where the and I didn't I think I'm gonna try and pull it over here more let's see here actually I'm gonna pull it over here more like right under the cloud where it's white instead of being right in the middle I don't know I always try to avoid the middle then I end up in the middle for the composition wise you know I don't like to center everything So right around here is where we're gonna start introducing texture, but I'm gonna leave this alone for the time being and let this kind of dry a little bit and start working on how these values are gonna draw into this focal point right here, which is the landscape area, which will be trees and grasses and where the grasses meet the water. So I'm gonna use Nori and a little bit of black. You know, what's funny is I used to not use a lot of black, but on this um, series of paintings that I'm working on right now, I started to pull in a lot of black. So these, these, these far away areas here, I'm gonna get them really dark. And we'll be pulling over them, but I just wanna get that 
that value set. And same over here. So I'm using this brush to kind of mimic a grassiness. Um, I'll eventually pull a knife and another type of brush. This is kind of my rough draft in the grass in. I'm gonna have a really thin strip of land coming in on that horizon. And let that water swoop in and then the land swoop back out out here. And I kind of want to make it feel like uh, this, you know, I live in Florida and, the, and a lot of times one body of water leads into another body, whether if you're in a river or coming out into the Gulf or, or the Atlantic. And so I want to leave this area here like I'm going out into infinite water. And also that's where the white transitions from the sky. Okay, so <clears throat> everything in the back is gonna be very impressionistic and loose. And so I'm just gonna start tapping in with this fan brush here, this, this horizon of a distant tree line. And I'm gonna be using, I'm gonna keep everything kind of neutral in the back. As it gets closer, I'm gonna bring in more greens, but I'm just gonna mix a little bit of this chartreuse that I know I'm gonna pull in the front in with this nori right here. So it doesn't look so black there. And I'm just gonna just imagine that these trees, there's a tree line here on the horizon. I'm just tapping it in. And it's, it's, and it's tapping in with a little bit of that white number five and that's okay, because it's like light sh shining through there. And I gotta, this is the area I have to be really careful where I wanna keep this really thin distant horizon from getting too thick. And this, this one's a little high, so um, I think I could fix that. And so I've got a little bit of that green mixed in there, but I'll, I'll, I'll get it out later. Um, and it's okay because it kind of mixes with the horizon. Just like when you're looking in the distance, the colors start to just kind of, especially in light, they start to blend anyway and the, the landscape and the sky become the same. So I'll fix that up in a minute when it dries, but I'm gonna try and level out that horizon line again. Make the trees a little higher on this side, kind of cover up where I messed up there. Okay, so now I've, I've established the horizon. And so as of right now, I'm using a little bit of the medium viscosity, mixing in with the number five, pretty much done with the base coat for now. And no texture yet, okay. So I'm gonna just kind of create my shoreline here, grasses on the outer edge. I'm gonna keep them kind of really pale right here where this light's coming in. Kind of create this artificial shoreline here. I think I'm gonna, that because it's kind of accidental, but where this, bit of white came in, I'm gonna make, the because the, the, the shoreline here in the marshes, it's all over the place. So I'm just gonna take advantage of that now and let that water come all the way back here and then it shoots back out here. So I'm just kind of establishing my grass line. Yeah, this will all probably be painted over in a little bit, but I'm just trying to do a little bit of establishment. And everything is really far away right here, so get really small.
Have you tried painting on um, acrylic sheets instead of wood panels? I have not, but I'm an artist that I, I okay. This is more of my traditional style of painting right here, but I love experimenting. I love painting on and building on, and you know, I do a lot of welding and sculpting, so I'm open to any material. You know, if you look at our, this uh, piece of plexiglass that separates my office into here, there's paint stuck all over it over here. And the, the problem is it's in there pretty good. I'll never get it clean, but if I wanna peel that paint off of there, I could probably get it off if I really wanted to. So I, you know, it may or may not stick perfectly. So, but I think it's on there pretty good. I mean, we could try and pull it off, but I have not painted on acrylic panels. Okay, so um, we have an opportunity here to start building up the trees on the forefront, on the, on the background, or come in here and start drawing down the water. And this is an opportunity here where I can introduce a different color right now if I want. So what I like about these paintings is they're kind of, they're not completely monochromatic, but they're very limited in color palette. And it's very pleasing to me when I, when I see things with less color, but color really excites me. And so like, I did one yesterday um, where I added a little bit of our, one of our pinkish hue colors. It's the one over there on the, the, the 24 by 48 on the, on the bottom. Can't quite see it from there. All right, I think I'm gonna add a little bit of color. Maybe we'll do our rose quartz. Just a hair, just a, just a tiny faint glow into this horizon. I hope I don't mess it up. We'll see. kind of like it. It makes it feel a little bit more dynamic, but I don't want that green up there. Pull that out. Disaster. Okay. That nori keeps wanting to pull in. I kind of need to stand back a little bit from it to kind of make sure I'm doing the right thing. I have a tendency to stay in a painting too long. And if I don't look back further at it, then I kind of mess things up. So I'm trying to get a little perspective on it right now. Okay.
So in Northwest Florida here, we have a lot of tree lines that are filled with these longleaf pines or loblolly pines. And so they're kind of just everywhere. So they're in a lot of my landscapes and I get to do those in a very loose impressionistic way. And so I'm going to start just popping in the tree line. I'm gonna pop a little bit of that rose quartz in there to kind of balance out with what's going on right there. This was fun about, I could just throw in any color I want. And a lot of my landscapes, like I said, they're based on places I've been or live near. And, but you also get to make them imaginary and bring in all these colors that, it's kind of like a fantasy color. So let's see here. So this right here is an experimental color that will hopefully be selling soon. And this is number five in black. And I just started using it yesterday and I love this. What I love about it is it, the way it just glides and it's so thin, but it has so much pigment in there. It just, it's almost like ink, but it's more viscous than the ink and it just has perfect coverage and it, and it stays wet longer. And I've been using this a lot lately. Well, lately since yesterday, but I've been using the number five a lot lately. So here's the thing that one day I was painting and I didn't have a paintbrush with me and I had to do these far tree lines. And so I used a razor blade. So no kids allowed, adults only. But I kind of like the way it did these really fine, all these, the, they did these really fine trees. And so basically all these longleaf pines are really skinny. They were designed, they were kind of re-engineered for growing uh, for paper mills. So, you know, in, in lumber. So they were really clean, low branches. So it's, they're really straight. And so it's these little, straight lines with this razor blade. Great way to get this impression of these distant trees. And I'm mixing a little bit of the rose quartz, black and white to just like wherever this is coming from is so it's kind of glowing on the trees.
Uh, what did you mean by number five viscosity? So the number five, we, we, the, the number five is, it has a very low viscosity. And number five is because it's our fifth test bat. Fifth, fifth, I can't say it, fifth test. Fifth test batch. Fifth test batch, and so we called it number five. And so now our whole line will probably be called number five now. This is the original one we did with the white. This is our second batch we just made. We ran out after our initial test run that we put out, and we're bottling our new batch right now, and it should be out next week. But anyway, so number five. I use a lot of number five lately because of the viscosity here is thin enough. It's got just enough thickness in it that it... It, it's not like water, like a watery paint. It's like a like a cream, you know, like a like just like heavy cream that hasn't been whipped or anything. But what's great about it is it has so much white pigment in there that the coverage, the opacity is amazing. I just love it because I can mix colors or I can go over things and it just gets full coverage. It stays wet longer and it glides. And so it's got this silky smooth glide to it. And the way it transitions and blends, in which I'm going to show... And this part right here, when I'll put some wet number five, and that's where I'm gonna start building texture into this because I don't wanna to build too much texture right there in this background because um, it's far away and you don't see texture that way. Clouds, you feel texture because they're overhead and they're, they're so three dimensional. But as I come in here, but the number five works perfectly for blending into textures, works perfectly for really flat backgrounds and like I said, it blends well and the opacity is really good. Okay. So I'm going to finish this tree line here and then maybe we'll jump into uh, where those two meet. Now you can do this with a brush. makes the trees in a distance. So again, I, so I'm not giving these trees a lot of texture in the back because they're so far in the background. When I start building the trees up, like right here, they'll have a lot more texture. And you can see on there, those are the ones that were done with a razor blade too. jump into that transition now where we're going to draw from the horizon where it's white and we're going to, as we get closer, it's going to turn blue. And so where I want to, I'm going to keep it mostly flat from this point up. And so get this nice and wet here. So the two colors of the water that I'm gonna bring on the bottom here, I'm gonna bring in our Viridian. You can see that's the Viridian. I'm gonna be really subtle, try and be subtle with the color. And just a little bit of thalo blue. I'm gonna to have to tilt this because this is very wet and I said that like I said the number five is really slippery and it's going to want to glide right off it's going to start with a little bit of texture in there and just start getting a feel of how it's all going to blend 
And so right now I'm just doing white and I can see those are the patterns I want. The light I'm is gonna be coming in this way. So it's gonna get darker over here and lighter over here. It's gonna go like this. So. How long does the texture stay wet to work with? It all depends on where you live. I've painted out west in the desert and it dries pretty fast, like in Nevada and Arizona. Um, but here in Florida, you know, I've got a good hour and a half of working time. Like right now you can see that's still pretty wet right there, but it might be hard to go back into that cause it's getting a little bit of, it's still pretty wet, but you got almost an hour, but it all depends on the humidity. Could you paint over it once it's dry? Yes, you can. Yeah. And I, I do that sometimes. Um, there's completely style, there's completely different styles of painting I do where I do paint everything after it's dry. I do, it's, it's a, just a different style of painting. Over here on the darker side, I'm gonna pull in some of the grass color. So when I put the grass in it, because this is gonna be the grass color, it will kind of balance out. And are you using the matte titanium white heavy texture or um, the titanium white heavy texture with gloss? I'm using the gloss. Um, all of these right here are gloss paints, except for the, um, the base coat comes out like a semi-gloss which is kind of nice because the big flat plain fields when they're the of color, when they're really glossy, they glare too much. So that kind of works out really nicely. So I'm gonna leave this be for just a minute on the area where this is. It should stay wet long enough for me to finish it. I wanna go ahead and bring the grasses in so it's all tied together. And then I'm gonna bring more textures into this area right here as we're kind of uh, tying up the water area, but I need to go ahead and get the grasses in possibly the tree area. In.
So I'm gonna put a couple trees in there, some some of the larger trees, and um, gonna figure out where they're gonna be. What's this process you're doing? Right? So right now I'm gonna take some of our, right now my trees are gonna, everything in here is kind of cool colors. So often are raw umber. However, I'm gonna be using black in these to keep them kind of on a gray scale. And so I've got our carbon black. I'm just gonna like get this down into the bag right there. But I don't want it to be fully black. And so just because I have this handy, I'm going to hit, hit that with a number, number five. See how almost the bag is almost split. And I kind of got lucky on that split. So we'll see how this works out. And that way I can, when I'm piping them out, I can have, I can have one side lighter and one side darker. Let's see how that works out. And so I'm just going to pipe some titanium white into the bag. bag mix it a little bit so it's not so stark and I'm gonna cut just a small hole like always cut smaller first because these first trees are gonna be um, a little thinner and I'm always gonna test it on the pallet so right now I'm just kind of running out the liquid that went in And so we've got a nice gray tree, but if I turn it over, I got a black tree. So, so I can show two tone. And so if I want to, I can really focus on where the light is in the painting and have the white side come out more into the center and then the dark side push it out to the outside. I don't always pull it off correctly, but let's see if we could do it. So there's a perfect, so you can see black and then the white. So you can kind of see the, the way they're gonna show up when they pipe out. So if you, I know from the camera, you see more of a black on this side and then there's more white on that side. And I don't do these trees organically correct. I just kind of know that most of these pine trees, most of their growth is on top. This is kind of high and put it down. You know, I, um, I, I, got a, I got a pretty good angle, yeah. Okay. It's kind of hard, hard, hard to, uh, yeah, there. whatever feels more natural. Okay. Yeah. So now I can pull up to it. It was kind of, my hand was getting shaky doing that up there. So, we're gonna get some of our chartreuse here. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna be piping it right out of the bag onto the painting. I'm gonna pipe it onto the pallet here. And then, I 
mix these complementary colors, which is the nori, mostly it'll be nori and maybe a little bit of white. So basically I was just trying to tone down the chartreuse a little bit. I love the chartreuse just as it is, but for this particular painting, it was a little warm. And so when I put that black in there and I add this white, it, it, it's not completely cool, but it's not as warm as it was. And so here's the deal. When, I, when I'm doing uh, treetops, um, as I said, this is the bottom of the knife. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna tap it off and pull it off. You can see right there, that's a tap and a pull, a tap and a pull. And they kind of have that nice canopy look. And so this is not traditionally how you would use a palette knife, but it's how I use a palette knife. And so I'm gonna get it on there, I tap and pull, tap, pull. And so eventually you get a nice rhythm to it. I just realized is I'm using this one knife for this entire painting. There's many knives you can do, but I've become very adapted to this one knife for a lot of my paintings. Sometimes I put the treetops in first because I want to know exactly where they go because sometimes when I'm drawing in the bag, I forget where I'm supposed to go because a lot of this is about memory or like where you want to go with something. So sometimes I, I might go in and put a tree top in first. I think I'm gonna make this these trees just bigger over here. So I'm gonna cut the bag bigger. I didn't really mean to like jab into that cloud that much, so get a little bit more white in there so it feels really integrated into that cloud. So this is kind of a mistake here. So I'm just gonna bring a little branch up into that. I'm realizing. I'm 
ね。So we're gonna come back down into the bottom. Start tying it all in together. Do you plan out your compositions or just do it, or does it just come to you as you're painting? All the above. So this particular composition, I did it yesterday, so I didn't have to plan it out. But when I did it yesterday, I didn't plan it out either. Like, I, um, since I know these landscapes really well, I kind of make them up. This is not an exact place. It's just a combination of a lot of places. So I just kind of make them up and I, I don't really know exactly where I'm going to go, but I have a general idea. However, on certain other styles of paintings, I have to completely plan them out and sketch them out and go a lot slower into them. But this is a, a fun way to paint because it's very loose. I'm not trying to be perfect. I'm not looking at a picture saying, oh, that's wrong. And so that's what makes this kind of an, like kind of an enjoyable way to paint. But it's also very expressive because you just keep moving through it without having to look at a picture and say, oh, that's wrong. There is no wrong, you know? So does that help? Maybe. So I could spend a lot of time right here when I'm trying to, um, to integrate from the grass line into the water. Um, it, it just goes on forever. I'm gonna kind of do the abridged version today, but basically what I'm trying to do is make sure that the water next to the grass balances and doesn't feel unnatural. And so like I said, it's gonna be darker over here and lighter over here. That, that part might get a little darker. So basically I need to just pull a little bit of the grass colors into the water. Like it's got a slight reflection of the grass color. And this is an area that when I forgot who asked the question earlier, can I go back when it's dry and this is a great area if i stopped right here i could blend this even better when this is dry because um i'm not going to pull in this kind of semi wet paint which i just discovered right there was happening but i also i often find myself without thinking about it putting myself into these challenges where i kind of mess up a little bit like that like i said right there because the the colors are not blending in perfectly together, but I'm gonna make it work.
Okay, so I am gonna bring in a different knife. I'm gonna bring in our round pedal knife because I'm gonna go ahead to, to bring in a lot of texture composition here. Show you how the, how the texture kind of brings in is um, put lily pads in here. This is very impressionistic on the lily pads. I'm gonna use the same green. I might pull in a little bit of that rose quartz that I want, kind of like it's glowing in there. And so the, go the goal is here is to get a nice dollop of paint on there. And I'm just tapping it off, tapping it off, tapping it off. But now I want to imagine, so like this reflection here could almost be lily pads, but I'm gonna take a little bit of this on here, pack this on there and imagine those lily pads just kind of fading out in the distance. Maybe going into this little area right here. So it's it's all about impression. That's an impression that those lily pads are taken off back in that little section there. So one of the great parts about the lily flowers are the, the lily pads of the lily flowers. So this is one where you get to use the bag right as a tool again too. So I'm gonna call it, cut a small tip about a third of an inch off of there. And imagine like a nice lily flower coming in there. So I'm just gonna make the loose impression of a lily flower. I'm gonna do three or four of them. And then maybe a couple dots for color that are gonna pop in there. And then, let's see. So as Neil, our paint maker, named this paint Handmade Jam, which is really kind of, what do we call this color again? Uh, it's a Napathol Violet. It's a Napathol Violet. So it's, it's you know, you're gonna see, it looks very earthy there, but it's gonna glow. It's kind of cool. It's just gonna pop out. So in, in the centers of the uh, lily flowers, there's usually yellow and pinks and, you know, and stuff. And so take it just a little bit on my knife there and just pop that up. Would you come come over close to that? Oh, oh, okay, cool. And so you can see on all that, I'm just going. I'm going very impressionistic on that. I'm trying not to make this perfect, and I, I like that look. It looks just like a very painterly hand feel to it. Because I'm look like we're struggling through it. So I'm gonna mix a little bit of that watercolor here on the palette. So it kind of just is pulling through there and gets a loose impressionistic look there where that last, it's like there's not a lot of blue in there but that last little blue just really just pops in there. Just like you got a little bit of color there and a little bit of color there and it really just jumps out. And so, you know, now that I'm gonna tie this painting together, I'm looking here where I've got these trees that are just plopped in there. So I've kinda gotta, kinda like what I started doing there, I gotta tie these in so they just don't look like sticks sticking on top of the grass. I gotta kinda blend them into the grass.
So I wasn't really intending to pull that rose quartz in there, but I like how that just started to just really tie it all in there. So there's a point where I, where I don't know what I'm doing until I do it. I kind of like now how that just kind of like this glows and that brought a little bit of warmth in that to that but i kind of like that it's not intentional so i could stop now or you can see like on these that i put these grasses in here um let's see i kind of like it without it but also good for demonstration i can just show you how that goes on so And I think instead of like using the the violet color, I'm gonna use the um, rose quartz for the little tiny little flowers in there to really tie it all in together. So I'm just going to cut a little tip off of here for these little flowers. I want them to stay really small because I just want them, you know, I'm kind of learning too about color sometimes and the subtlety of color because I'm usually really bombastic about it and do lots and lots of color. But as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm, I'm learning restraint myself on color. So I want these everywhere that rose quartz is subtle. So I want to make sure I keep it subtle and not overpower. So a lot of times on all these marshes, there's usually some type of flower, swamp mallows, or some type of flower that kind of pops up around them. And so that's what these usually represent. Although this is not a mallow, this, this would just be like some type of little wildflower. But just these little pops in there. Kind of tie it all in. Without going too crazy with it. And I'm going to go into, let's use black. I think black would be a nice sharp contrast on these. And I want to keep these stems really thin so the black doesn't overpower either. So a lot of, often when I'm working on these bags, I test them. You can see all the places here on my easel where I test them or on my palette, just to make sure I have the right diameter and everything. And it also allows me to know how much strength I got to put into there. So I'm just gonna just come right to the top of them. Just have a nice steady drawdown. So this is where, you know, this is why I love these bags. I like to be able to apply the paint as a tool. I like to be able to apply, like when I was doing the chartreuse, just the amount I want on there. I don't have to scoop it out. And I am definitely curious about what people think about these bags because I love them, but I want to make sure everybody else loves them too. They love your blazer. What's that? <laughs> I said they, they, they uh, love your blazer. My, my J. Crew blazer? Yeah. So I feel like I could have been really bold putting that black in there because it is pretty stark, but it's a nice contrast. So I think I'm going to 
bring in some other grasses in there just to kind of that, that black, which I do like the black, but it's pretty stark. So I'm basically going to use the primary color for that grass I'm going to put in there, which is the nori, to kind of balance it all out. Maybe just a little bit of chartreuse. Since I already have it on the palette, I'm going to use my treetop green. And the good thing is I'm going to put all this that I had in the palette. I'm only going to use a little bit, but now to, whatever I don't use will be preserved in this bag that I can use at a later time. So look right here. This is what I love about like how the, the things that happen, if you look at pattern almost like watermelon pattern you know those are the things that happen that I don't want to ever mess up and so that's just by putting you know there's basically three colors in there and so you get that nice variegated look which has a very natural look so sometimes also if I want it to come out a little lighter I'll just pull down there to get some of that dark that was in the beginning to get a little bit lighter and so I've got to keep this bag tight and it's just, this is a rhythm you just learn after a while of how much pressure to apply and while you're pushing it. And definitely make sure you get all the air bubbles out because I just heard one. And then I'm just gonna use the same thing I made the grass there to sign it. And I think that's gonna be it. So there you have it. What's the best way to store the bags after use? So, for instance, so I've got, you know, the one I, I barely cut any out. I just squeeze a little bit out and pretty much it's going to be fine right there. We use paper clips. We're going to, we're going to be sell, not selling with the bags soon are going to come with clips that just clip them there. But for right now we use paper clips, but I paint a lot. So maybe it's not fair, but I, I just leave them like this because I'm going to be, I paint almost every day. So I'm in here all the time working, but if you're not working on it right away, just squeeze out the little bit there so it's nice and flat and you can, you can just fold it or put a paper clip and then probably in the next few weeks when we start putting clips in everybody's bags. And even if you already bought paint and you get a clip, when we get them, you can ask us and we'll send you some. But basically that's it. I mean, and it stays, it's just like, if you imagine a traditional paint in a tube, that's what I think about this, but it doesn't have a screw cap. So it's a paper clip. It's just pinching it, it's a piece of tape. It's the new clip that's coming in because the deal is, so we, what I'm really excited about. So I know people might've had breakage in their bags before, and we've got this new plastic. It's like military grade plastic. That's super, super strong. And so, I wanted to be able to be able to ship them without breaking them, you know, cause it was a, it's kind of a difficult task, you know, we're learning as we go here. And what's great about this is, is the strength of this bag. And along with this bag, we knew we were gonna start coming out with the closure clips. So we should have them really soon. If you have any questions, um, just let us know. Now's your chance to learn anything about our products. Um, ways that we can improve or any kind of colors, mediums that we can offer for you guys. So Do you ever use uh, frosting tips in the paint bags? We do. Um, so, 
Isn't that one that has the gold edge right there? Sorry. With, with the which one? I did one that had the gold. I wanted to show it. Oh, like it was just a pallet of gold? I, I piped some in. But yes, I do use paper chips, and I'll show you how that goes. <clears throat> but I thought it'd be a good opportunity to show that gold. I did it on a little piece of cardboard. I must have thrown it away. Okay, pastry tips. Of course, I've done a lot of paintings with pastry tips. I used to paint a lot of flowers. I don't paint them as often right now. However, I used to do all these flowers with the tips. Let's see if I can find some tips here. You got some tips in the, um, oh, yeah. never mind, you found them. I kind of got paint all over them. That's why I paint. So basically, I'll stop rustle them in the back here in a second. So basically, if you if you look at how any video on how to decorate cakes with flower chips, you can use paint exactly the same way. So that's actually, I used to do these paintings with full roses all over them. And I used this rose tip and I used the little pedestal thing and I would put little pieces of um, plastic on there. Actually, I could show you that one too. Show you both. So, by the way, this is the rose tip right here, and the much there's one that's much bigger that I like using. This one's kind of small, but you'll get the uh, point of that. So let's make a rose with rose quartz. made jam in there with the rose quartz. So if you want it the, the uh, like coming out with a tip, what's kind of fun is putting two colors in there. So I'm going to make this a nice little streak of this violet color. And so you can see it's only on this part of the bag. It's not on the whole bag. I can take that out for you. I'm gonna start a new one. This one. Okay. Let me get a little piece of plastic. Kind of show you how they how they traditionally do them, or how I've done them before, where I do a lot. So I'm going to make an impromptu rose um, I forgot what they call that, a rose, um, like a rose nail I think they call it, but I'm going to make an impromptu one. You know where that duct tape is? Oh I got it right here.
So they have these little circular, they're called um, rose nails or something, and you, you, so you can pipe the rose on there. However, when I've done paintings where I, I add them later, I would take a bunch of little pieces of plastic like this, and then, so this way you could turn it, you know, but when you have a nail, you can keep turning it, but this is good enough for now. I'd make myself a nice little dollop in there. Unfortunately, I just had it upside down. We'll do another one. This is my practice one. Cause it sure is janky. Plastic. You got a piece of plastic. Oh, there it is. All right, so hopefully I can get it this time. Okay. So I would usually just start with a little dollop in the middle, and I'm just doing like little like half turns around. You just keep going, and then I start leaning it downward. And so, you know, you can make these and you can make a hundred or a thousand and dry them and then reassemble re them into a painting. I would just keep doing them like that. And that's a very loose one, you know, need a bit more practice, I haven't done it in a while. However, I'll show you some other tricks. So, I have just like a, a general star tip in here. What's fun about this stuff is putting multiple colors in there. So, let's take a little bit of, let's make Hansa in large green. I'm just gonna mix them together. A Marge Green, by the way, is named after my grandmother, who was a painter from St. Petersburg, Florida. It's a lot of fun with the pipe, the piping bags, because you can just be very, you just, just have a lot of fun with it. So these are gonna dry exactly like that, and you can see how they have that two, that two tone right there. I love getting like the multiple tones of colors in there. So if I was, at least to say I painted that on the painting, you know, I would just be piping all around it like that. But, but like I said, you can take that flower off once it dries on the plastic and apply it to whatever you want. And I can show you how that works. Basically my floor is plastic the paint doesn't stick to it. So if you could take plastic, like a lot of times you could take our wood palettes or the wood, the canvases, they already have plastic on it and anything you paint on there will peel off. Like, uh, oh, yeah, there you go. So this just peeled off the of plastic right here. So th that was the side that was on the plastic. And then here are some flowers that we had made, I don't know, it was a while, a few weeks ago. And these right here will pop right off now as whole flowers. And so what the intention with these were, we were gonna make, we were gonna pile them all back in together on a little painting. Because it's kind of hard to like paint them like that. So there's kind of infinite things you could do with the paint, but this is, the paint directly just painted on the wood palette that we sell before you actually take the plastic off. And you can see when I was painting on them here, I always do my first painting with the plastic on there because it, it like gives them an extra life, you know? But that's basically how you could peel that off the plastic. Yeah. So, 
So yeah, if anybody had any questions about our paints or you want to know techniques or anything, just let me know and I'm happy to share with what I know. And maybe I can learn some things from you too because I've seen lots of people using our paint now doing things I've never done before, which is actually really exciting. So any other questions? All right, I think I'm gonna wrap up.